Hi, everybody. I'm going to talk a little bit about error. I'm not talking about mistakes. I'm talking about uncertainty. Error, in terms of mathematics, has to do with um, the difference between an exact answer and a calculated answer. Um, it also has to do with precision. So it's a matter of accuracy and precision. So I've got a little demonstration. We've probably all seen this before um, in discussions regarding accuracy versus precision. So on the left side, um, I will show you a couple of demonstrations here. So these are all throws of darts at a dartboard. OK, so the darts I just threw onto this dartboard are a pretty wide spread. So, um, but one of the dart throws, the one in the middle here, landed right on the bullseye. Now, if you average all of these dart throws together, it actually turns out to be pretty accurate. However, the precision is terrible. The darts are thrown all over the place. So we have accuracy, but we don't have precision on this dartboard on the left. Now on the right, we'll throw another collection of darts. OK, so now my spread on this collection of darts is all in this smaller area here. So both of these are 12 dart throws, but on the right side, none of the darts are anywhere near the bullseye, but all of them are very near each other. So we have a high level of precision, but a low level of accuracy. So we have high precision and low accuracy. Whereas on this side, we have decent accuracy. I won't call it high accuracy because it's a pretty widespread. So we'll call it decent accuracy, given that we hit the bullseye. But we have poor precision. OK, now on the left side, because we have poor precision, there's really not a whole lot we can do to fix this. We have all the accuracy we're going to get, but we have very poor precision. So there's not a systematic change that we can do here. However, on the right side, we have a very good level of precision here. So we can make a systematic change to the way these dart throws are being done in order to improve accuracy. So all we need to do really is change where we're aiming for, and we'll hit the bullseye or we'll get near the bullseye every time. So we can improve, we can take a high precision um, calculation and easily repair a bias in a high precision calculation using a systematic error and a systematic correction. So that's a little demonstration of the difference between accuracy and precision. Now, as we get into uh, iterative numerical methods, what we're going to be doing is we're going to try to work with both accuracy and precision. Um, but we can set tolerances in such a way that we can improve our precision just based on what kind of a tolerance we're willing to use. Um, as far as accuracy goes, accuracy, sometimes you have to assume accuracy. Now, I know everybody's going to groan when I say that because nobody wants to assume that you're accurate. However, when we're making uh, iterative calculations, oftentimes we don't have an exact answer to compare to. So we have no way of actually knowing if we're accurate. All we are able to do is determine our precision. So I'll give another example of how that might work. So let's say you are in a hardware store and you're trying to buy a thermometer. You want to buy the thermometer that is the most accurate. So you want the best thermometer out of this collection of thermometers. 
And let's say you're looking at the shelf and there are 30 thermometers on that shelf. Now, all of those thermometers are gonna be reading the temperature of the hardware store. Now you don't actually know what the exact temperature of the hardware store is. You can look at any one of these thermometers and it's gonna give you a number and you could assume that number is the temperature of the hardware store. But you don't have any true answer to compare to. All you have are 30 different thermometers that are all giving similar but maybe slightly different readings. So if you wanted to pick the best one out of those thermometers, what you would do is you take all 30 thermometers, you read the temperature from each of them, and then you find out what the average temperature all those thermometers are reading is. So maybe you have a temperature range of somewhere between 67 degrees and 71 degrees, and you take an average of all of those. The best thermometer in that collection is gonna be the one that reads closest to that average value. Now, we don't know for certain that that thermometer that reads closest to the average value of all 30 thermometers is actually giving you the most accurate reading. What we do know is that it is closest to the average. So the assumption we need to make in order to decide that that's the best thermometer out of the 30 is that these thermometers are not reading any kind of bias. So a bias is a systematic error. A systematic error is one that you can calculate and correct. So if all these thermometers, all of them read two degrees low, that's a systematic error. So you may still get excellent precision with the, you know, the thermometer that's closest to the average, but that's still gonna be two degrees low if you have a two degree bias. So when you're shopping for thermometers, you don't know if there's a bias or not. You have no way to compare the temperature reading with the actual temperature of the room, unless you find some other accurate instrument in order to calibrate by. But without any kind of calibration, your best bet is to look for precision and look for the closest unbiased, um, unbiased uh, instrument. So another way to define a bias is an error in the mean value. Okay, so that's one part of the uh, equation. And this, the bias has to do with accuracy. So a low bias means high accuracy. A high bias means poor accuracy. The other side of this is the variance. So the variance is a measure of how much variation there is between measurements. So if all of your measurements are very close together, you have a low variance, high precision. If you have a bunch of measurements that are very far apart, you have a high variance and low precision. So variance is your random error. And that's a measure of precision. Okay. Now, like I said, in a lot of the work that we're gonna be doing, we don't have a very good way of measuring bias. The only thing we can do when we can't measure the bias is we can only assume that we don't have a bias. Sometimes that assumption is not valid and sometimes it is. So um, there are other calculations that we can make outside of what, uh, uh, what work we do to determine our bias. But what we can do is work with our variance. So that's kind of where we're mostly gonna concentrate as we talk about error and um, work with our uh, iterative numerical methods. So let's talk a little bit about types of error that we can find So sources of error.
Okay. So error can be can come from a number of different sources. And we'll list a few of them here and talk about whether or not we can do anything about it. So um, we can start off with observational errors. Observational error comes from uh, errors in making measurements. Another, another name for this might be measurement error. So measurement error. These are errors uh, primarily due to human activity. So if you have a person out in the field taking measurements with a measurement instrument, observational error comes from the person's use of that instrument. Now it doesn't necessarily mean the person's incompetent and doesn't know what they're doing with the instrument. It could just be the way the instrument is used in general. So um, let's talk about a tape measure which is a fairly simple instrument for measuring distance. Um, now, obviously you could have somebody in the field who doesn't know how to use a tape measure, in which case you're gonna get poor results, but also just the way the instrument is used. Uh, when you pull out a tape measure on the end of it, there's a little uh, piece of metal sticking down that you can attach to the side of something. So you can use that to hold the tape measure while you pull the tape out and take your measurement. So some of the observation error that can happen here is where you hook on that piece of metal on the end, and then at what angle you walk away from where it's hooked on. So ideally, you want to be 90, 90 degrees perpendicular to the thing you're trying to measure from. But small variations in that angle are very easy to have occur when a human is operating a tape measure. And it's not because the human doesn't know what they're doing, it's because the human is human and there's environmental factors and things like that that may cause uh, differences in how these observations are recorded. So observational error, a lot of it can be attributed to humans. Some of it can be tr contributed to by environmental conditions. So an example here of an environmental condition that might uh, cause an instrument error, let's say you're using a photoionization gas detector to measure uh, concentration of a particular vapor in, um, in a refinery, for example. Well, if you hold that in the wind, that's gonna change what vapor goes into the intake of the photoionization gas detector. So there's environmental factors that are gonna influence the uh, the way the instrument is able to measure concentrations in this case. Another environmental factor might be temperature or humidity. All these are going to have an effect on what vapors enter a photoionization gas detector. So the environment can certainly have an influence on observational error. The instrument itself might also have intrinsic errors. which will, again, contribute to observational error. So that's one source of error. That's uh, real life errors that you might encounter in the field by taking measurements with any kind of measurement instrument. All of these errors can be mitigated uh, using some kind of control, possibly a better, more expensive instrument, um, environmental shielding to prevent such errors from occurring, uh, standardized samples, things like that. It's always good to try to eliminate humans from the equation because human error out of all of these is probably gonna be the largest. So that's observation or measurement error. Another source of error is called um, model error. So this takes it out of the field and into um, making calculations. A model is at its core, a mathematical representation of a physical process. So how you make that mathematical representation 
may or may not include some kind of errors. So oftentimes, if we're trying to make a mathematical representation of a physical process, such as groundwater flow, for example, uh, there are lots of things that would go into an equation to represent groundwater flow. Any equation that you use to represent a natural process is going to incorporate some assumptions and some parameterizations. When you incorporate these things, those come with some kind of error. So this comes from assumptions and parameterizations. These are all things that we would use to simplify a mathematical uh, representation such that it would become something that's possible to solve. So observational error, model error. Now, another part that's similar to model error and model error, the only way to correct model error is to create a better model that represents more of the physical process and replaces assumptions with um, equations, replaces parameterizations again with equations. All this comes down to equations. Okay, now another source of error, and this is particularly true for running uh, computer simulations, is called round off error. In the first class, we talked about um, how your computer is able to represent real numbers out to, in a floating point number, out to nominally eight decimal places, in a double precision floating point number, nominally out to 16 decimal places. Any decimal places beyond those decimal places that we're able to represent on the computer just get lopped off. And so we lose decimal places. Now that doesn't necessarily sound like a big deal when you're losing decimal places out to, you know, past the 17th decimal place, but doing what you do with a computer, when you may be doing millions of operations, all of these uh, round off errors propagate through your calculations and eventually may become a significant source of error. So it's something to be aware of. The last source of error that I want to mention is called truncation error. Truncation error is sort of similar to model error and could also be considered somewhat similar to round off error. Truncation error is a part of a mathematical representation. So a lot of the iterative processes that we're gonna to wanna to work with in class have to do with uh, approximating an equation or a type of mathematical uh, formula. So we're gonna be approximating things like differential equations. We're gonna make approximations for derivatives and things like that. Each of these approximations are often based on, uh, if you, you know, look back in the derivation of a lot of these processes, somewhere in there, you're gonna find the Taylor series. So the Taylor series is an infinite series that you can use to represent any continuous function. Now, if you use the Taylor series to represent a continuous function, eventually you're going to start lopping off terms. When you lop off those terms, every part of the Taylor series you don't use out to the infinite number of, of terms goes into the truncation error. So it's an infinite series. Um, I should rewrite this here and call this terms that are not included, terms from an infinite series that are not included in your calculation.
Okay. So these are some sources of error that you may encounter. For what we're gonna work on in our class, the error that we're gonna work with the most, the errors we'll work with the most are these bottom ones. We're not gonna to see too much observational error. And for the most part, we're not gonna really determine where our error, what our sources of error are. What we really want to determine is what the size of our errors are, the magnitude of our errors. So that's the next part I wanna discuss. Okay, so the simplest, the simplest way of quantifying error occurs when you have a true value to compare against. This is rarely the case, but sometimes we will uh, determine a true value based on either a lookup value or um, some other calculated value. So when you have a true value, So if your true value is available, again, maybe it comes from a analytical calculation. Maybe it comes from a lookup table or other published source. We can now compare our calculated or measured value against this true value. Now oh, maybe also we could consider a measurement. I'll we'll call it a good measurement. So if we want to determine the error, the simplest way to do that is going to be a calculation of um, what's called the absolute error, epsilon sub a for absolute error. And that's equal to your measured value. That's the difference between your, uh, let's say your model value, we'll call it. So your model value minus your true value. That is the um, absolute error. Now, sometimes that's a very good uh, way to quantify error but oftentimes it's not. So I'll give an example of when it might be a good quantity, good measurement of error. So let's say, I'm gonna kind of use distance as my measurement that I use for my examples most of the time. So let's say I'm measuring the distance between my, uh, where I have my chair situated in my home office here and my keyboard. And I'm measuring that distance using a tape measure. Um, and let's say, take another measurement where I measure the distance from my chair to the bedroom door. These are all measurements of distances that are fairly similar. We're all within the span of a few feet. So these are similar measurements. Any error in these measurements is gonna be um, fairly comparable. But let's say I'm measuring the distance from my chair to the door of my office, and I'm also measuring the distance from my house to downtown Los Angeles. Now these are very different scales, measure, uh, gonna be measured in even different scale units. So inside my room, I'm measuring in feet. Distance from here to downtown LA, I'm gonna measure in miles. So I can convert that to feet, however many miles there are times 5,280. So now I have measurements in feet that are very different from each other. So if my, if my uh, difference between my measurement and the true distance from my house to downtown LA is off by 30 feet, that's not really that big a deal. That's actually a pretty good measurement going from Torrance to Los Angeles within a span of 30 feet. 
But if my measurement between my desk and the door to my office is off by 30 feet, well, that's pretty bad because you know, my door is about six feet away. So at this point now, model versus true gives you, or model minus true gives you a measurement of error that is really scale dependent. And it's difficult to compare errors with different measurements if the scales are very different. So what we can do is we can normalize this measurement of error and um, make it so it's comparable. Now, something I should mention before we go any further, um, this measurement of error, model minus true, oftentimes it's not terribly important if your measurement is uh, positive or negative or which direction it's going in. So sometimes really all you need is the absolute value. It's still the same measurement. Um, and when we're working with things on the computer, uh, very commonly, all that really matters is the magnitude of the error, not the direction. So we'll very often take the absolute value of that measurement. Now, if we want to normalize this, um, then what we're going to find is called the relative true error. So relative true error, um, epsilon sub t, the relative true error, it's calculated in much the same way. So you're going to take your bottle minus true, but then you're going to normalize this error calculation by dividing by the true value. And again, you can use the absolute value if you don't care about the direction, just the magnitude of the error. So what this does is now it changes the error so that no matter what the scale of your measurements are, the error is comparable between scales. So this gives you a way to compare, um, possibly compare a distance measuring instrument. So let's say I have some kind of laser range finder and I'm using that to measure the distance from my desk to my door, then I'm getting up on top of my building, which actually isn't tall enough to do this, but just pretend it is, get up on top of my building and measure the distance to downtown LA with this laser range finder. Very powerful laser range finder, I might add. If I'm using a relative true error, then the, uh, the errors that I might encounter in both of those measurements become something I can compare with each other. Okay, so that's part of quantifying error. But what if we don't have a true value available? And oftentimes we don't. So this brings us back to the thermometer discussion where we don't know the true temperature of the hardware store, but we have 30 measurements of that temperature that we can compare to each other. So in this case, our measurement is gonna be taken in comparison to uh, some mean value or some other, me other measured value. So you're comparing a measurement with a measurement or a model with another model. So here's how we'll take a look at that. So let's come down here and say, uh, with no true value available, With no true value available, we're no longer able to uh, directly determine accuracy. So these two measurements up here, these are determinations of accuracy. If we don't have a true value, we can no longer calculate accuracy. Now we're down to calculating based on precision alone. So now we're going to calculate what's called the relative error. To calculate relative error, we're going to take our model value and compare it with our best available value. And then we're going to divide that by the best available value. So the denominator, whenever we're dividing on these relative errors, 
relative error or a relative true error. The denominator is always the best available value. If it's the true value, that's going to be your best available value. When you don't have a true value, you still may have a best available value. Um, when, so for the thermometer example, the best available value you have is the mean value. So this will determine which thermometer gives you the closest value to the mean. You calculate the, mo you calculate the error for every single one. Take the model minus the mean in that case, and that will give you a relative error. So from this point, when we don't have a true value available, now we have to determine what our best available value is. And that's going to depend a lot on what you're trying to calculate. OK, so I should just write on here also. This is a measure not necessarily of accuracy, but more of precision. OK, so that's, that's it for error for now. We're going we're gonna to be revisiting error frequently through the semester. And this relative error calculation that I've shown you here, which I'll put in a nice blue box here, this relative error calculation is something I want you to become very intimately familiar with. Because like I said, we're going to use this frequently starting now 